I had a professor once who said that the sociology of culture and knowledge starts from the premise that beliefs, values, worldviews, and mental processes are always tied to historical times and places and can be understood as social practices and cultural discourse in their own right. In other words, the way we cut up the world clearly affects the way we organize our everyday life. The way we divide our surroundings, for example, determines what we notice, how we talk about it, and what we choose to ignore. And while it's easy to talk about what's wrong with the world, it's more challenging to focus on what's right and how we might find those transformative moments that will allow us to navigate our future differently. I'd like to introduce you to Wendy Smith. I met Wendy a few months ago in Victoria, and hopefully in this episode of the Conversation Lab, we may find some of those transformative moments together. Wendy Smith is a Harvard-educated, award-winning academic and the Dana J. Johnson Professor of Management and Faculty Director of the Women's Leadership Initiative at the University of Delaware. She's an expert on organizational paradoxes, exploring how leaders and individuals effectively respond to contradictory yet interdependent demands. She spends her time working to better manage the paradoxes of life, the ones that we all face, and writes about them in her latest book that she wrote with Marianne Lewis, Both and Thinking. Embracing Creative Tension to Solve Your Toughest Problems. It's nice to see you again. I'd rather it was in person and not on Zoom, but here we are. So how are you? I'm good. I'm busy, uh, but I can't complain. I'm good. We are just heading into fall here in Philadelphia, which is great. Yeah, we're doing the same here and getting ready for colder weather. So I want to talk about your book and your work, but before we do, we had an opportunity to work together in the summer uh, at the Victoria Forum. Uh, The forum was Truth, Trust, and Turf, and our particular panel was Bridging Environmental Divides, Shifting Our Relationship with the Natural World from Extractive to Regenerative. Certainly no easy task, as we were asked to save the world, but uh, (laughs) I'm curious, what was it like for you? You mean about the forum overall? Yeah. I mean, I thought it was a powerful gathering and I was impressed with the quality of people that were there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, again, like just, if I think about that panel, what an incredible panel and maybe it inspired people to think about things a little differently, but I don't know what the implicate, I mean, connect, there's personal connections that were made. I don't know if there was any more sort of collective action that's going to happen. Yeah, I don't know either. I mean, I thought that the convening was quite powerful, but I can't tell what the implications were. I get the sense that most of the implications were in the conversations between senators and business leaders or senators and university leaders to be able to do something with that. So I'm kind of curious what the next steps would look like. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I just think that it's important that we have those difficult conversations. And I'm grateful for the opportunity for us to have met and, uh, and hopefully talk about how we have difficult conversations. Yes. Happy to dive in. Where should we start? Happy to go wherever. Well, well, tell us a little bit about yourself. There's so many different places to start on that question connected to the work in the book that, you know, I, I could start with my own research. So just by way of background, I got a PhD in organizational behavior, and I've been studying this idea of competing demands and paradox since I was in my doctoral program. And I could also say that One of the reasons that I studied this question of both and is because of the ways in which I struggled with questions of my own career and felt myself stuck in either or thinking about my own career and found this to actually be a quite useful lens in thinking about my own challenges. And, you know, that's something that I certainly, we we say, uh, people will often say research is me-search. So we study our own blind spot. And for me, the blind spots, you know, I I spent a lot of time kind of debating in college what I was going to do with my life. The debate for me at that point was uh, whether I was going to do what, what felt like really making a direct impact, which at that time was about becoming a physician and being a going going to medical school or whether I was going to do what I really loved, which was at that time, I did a whole lot of leadership in college. And um, I really debated that question pretty significantly. I, you know, I, I often tell this story that I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I was sitting in 
our college career services center when the center was still a physical center and you actually pulled out books and looked at possibilities. And I was debating what I was going to do as a summer job. Was I going to go and work in a lab and be, a, you know, follow a medical path? Or was I going to do something like work on, you know, work in DC in a lobby organization in DC, which is what I ended up doing. But I was so distraught by that debate and not sure where I was headed and feeling like I really needed a certain path and so frustrated by that, that I got on my bike. It was in the middle of late fall. It was really cold outside. And I just biked several miles up to this rock that was right in the middle of New Haven where I was at college. And I sat on the top of East Rock and I just sat there hoping that either some divine intervention or some internal decision-making would tell me the answer to my question, which of course none did, but and so I ended up biking back down without any clear path going forward. But I spent a lot of time sort of in that either or mindset around my own jobs, which is partially what led me into thinking about this idea of paradox. So, so where did that take you? Well, I mean, sadly, where I think that it didn't take me was it took me into a place of feeling stuck for years and years and years and feeling like I shouldn't be, as opposed to feeling like I was exploring and experimenting and and, and trying new things and didn't have to have an answer. It left me feeling like I should have an answer. And one of the reasons I was actually attracted to medical school and and the medical profession, besides the fact that it felt like it was hands-on, saving people's lives, literally, as a profession, was because it was such a clear path. And I thought, all these people know exactly what they're doing and I should know as well. And going into medicine was this very clear path. You take the pre-med courses, you go, you know, you take the MCATs, you go into medical school, like everything was laid out for you for years and years or so it felt. And instead where it took me was into a lot of angst. And if I were to go back, it would not be to change the deliberations or the experimentation or the questions, or it wouldn't, you know, I would still take a semester of chemistry and bio and labs and try it out. I just wouldn't, I would hope that I would train myself not to feel quite the same level of angst around it and to let go of that and to just be in the experimentation. But instead, it led me into a whole lot of angst. And ultimately, and Don, this is something that, you know, I think really did inform my thinking was that uh, because I didn't know what I was going to do after college, I decided to go and live abroad for a couple of years and basically punt on my decision making, basically punt on the fin- what felt like a fine finality of a career decision. And I went and lived in Israel. I grew up Jewish. I was culturally Jewish. I didn't know a lot uh, about the religion from a theological point of view or from a philosophical point of view. And I went and studied in a yeshiva, which is the traditional place to study Jewish text. And it was there and in that experience that I started to understand what the notion of living in paradox, living in competing demands with other people to help sharpen ideas was really all about was through both the text that I was studying and the process of studying that text, which was really powerful. Interesting experience. Uh, It begs a couple of questions. Isn't religion all about paradox? And I'm curious, how did you and Marianne Lewis meet? Yeah, well, I'll just say one more sentence about about this studies, because I think that One of the things that I found in studying paradox was the people who were really passionate about this topic early in the field of organizational theory all had some kind of religious background training interest. You know, there's something about the almost irrational absurdity that requires a leap of faith. And while it didn't matter what religion it was, it was not it was not religion per se or structured religion per se, but this sort of this uncertainty and this leap of faith that was really profound you know, for me, again, it was that Jewish text is really all about like traditional Jewish text is all about bringing in competing ideas and usually not giving an answer, uh, but offering the differing ideas. And in fact, there's one line in the text that's really powerful. It says, you know, these and these talking about like two different rabbis who are in conflict with each other, these and these you know, were the word of God, these and these, like both of these ideas were really important and powerful. And it's studied you know, Jewish text isn't studied alone the way that we, the way that we study in university. It's not a sole practitioner activity. It's a duo. It's you and somebody else in conversation with one another, with the idea being, you know, that quote, you sharpen each other like knives, like you're, you're, you're constantly pushing on each other for a deeper set of insights with each other. And to me, that was powerful. And I brought that into my PhD and it it relates to in part how Marianne and I met or not how we met, but how we started working together, which is that, 
a PhD process is very much about what do you as an individual bring to the table, or at least it's, it's built that way. It's not that way because you have a PhD advisor and a committee and people who are helping you think through these ideas, but it feels very much about how do you generate ideas on your own. And, um, and that's not my experience of academia. For me, the greatest ideas that I've developed or that I've thought through or that I've published have all been because they've, I've been in conversation with other people who have helped sharpen these ideas and, and, and develop better ideas. And the reason Marianne and I met is because I was studying innovation at IBM. I, what I was seeing was these top management teams grappling with the current world and the future world and trying to live in between them. And I had been given this great book when I was an undergrad by David Berg. It was his book, the Paradoxes of Group Life by Kenwin Smith and David Berg. And it looked paradoxical to me. And there were not a lot of people talking about paradox in the context of organizations and organizational theory and organizational dynamics. Marianne had just published a paper just the year before in 2000 in our in Academy of Management Review, which is our top theory journal. And that paper won best paper. And she was one of the first to bring together these small snippets of intellectual thought in organizational theory into this integrative paper. And I emailed her and I said, tell me everything you know, because this concept of paradox seems relevant. And so we sat down at one of our professional meetings and chatted. And, you know, we like to say the rest is history. We just have been working together since. What's the difference between conversational discourse analysis and the work that you do? I think of conversational discourse analysis as a tool for understanding and deepening our insight. So I don't think that they're different. I think that they can be, they can reinforce each other. In fact, our colleagues, Linda Putnam and Gail Fairhurst have a whole, their work really looks at the extent to which conversations inform paradox and that paradoxes arise through discourse. And conversational discourse analysis is a tool that they use to analyze and to surface paradoxes that arise through discourse. And they have a great paper in organizational research methods about how to do that work. It's not the tool that I typically use because it's just not the level. I, I tend to look at a more, a bit more of a macro level than deep into the discourse. It's a tool though, that's incredibly valuable and useful. And I am so grateful to people like Linda Putnam, who's been doing work on paradox and how paradox emerges in discourse for a really long time, building on work by, you know, Gregory Bateson and work around how paradox emerges in the ways that we interact with people and in our relational interactions and discourse. I don't know if there was more that you were thinking about in terms of conversational discourse analysis. No, I think that's a good place to start, but I've got a couple of thoughts noodling around. One, I'm thinking about the uh, the mule analogy, and I'm also thinking about how polarized we've become and how that all fits together. It's funny, you know, just this morning we were doing a webinar for a group of students, academics in our field that are interested in impact. And we were talking about, so there's two sides to that, where are we now coin? There's the side that says, well, actually, people are interested in using the word paradox and talking about both and thinking as a tool that's valuable. And so we see that increasingly in consultant speak or in organizational speak or even politicians raising this language of we've got to live in the both and. So, you know, so there's there's that side of it, which is that well, what we say in the book is that the reason paradoxes emerge or surface more, we, we say they exist. It's just that they can be latent. We're not that aware of them. And the reason they surface more is under the conditions of when there's more change, when tomorrow becomes today faster and the tensions of time and today and tomorrow become more poignant, when there's more scarcity or the feeling of scarcity and there's fewer resources. So that tension of who gets the resources becomes more salient. And when there's more plurality or a diversity of voices having an opinion on something and therefore the differences in those voices and the, the tensions between them become more salient. And you know, we would say, look, all of those things are happening now. And so we're aware, we're more aware of these paradoxes. So that's one side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is what you're saying, which is, the, you know, the other experience, which is that in the context of diversity and plurality, we have become more polarized. So we have so sociologically as a people, as, a, as societies become less and less in conversation in the political realm with people who have different opinions than ours because the issues that have come up are so significant and so consequential. And we're so scared about what happens if we don't answer them in a way that we feel passionate about that we're not. And, and 
we live in a world where the institutions around us, the social media, the, the political uh, spheres make it easier for us to live in our own echo chambers. And so on one hand, we're talking about both anding in a bunch of realms around organizations and companies. And, and on the other hand, in our political realm, and certainly like we're living in these opposite spheres and not talking to each other. There's 